Go up here. Let me start over. Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. That gives me a good place to start the video. This morning, I've got a message for you out of Romans chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. If you like to title your messages, this one is A Living Sacrifice. A Living Sacrifice. There's a reason I have struggled to get this one to you. Whether you're watching online or whether you're in this room, oh, the Lord has been doing something with me this week, and here we go. Hope you've had time to find Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer over the reading of his word. Father, I thank you this morning for this passage of scripture. I thank you for the message that you've prepared for us. I thank you that you've brought us together to hear it by whatever means we're hearing it today, and I pray that your will and your work are accomplished because we gathered for that purpose and nothing else. Lord, I know I pray this all the time, but I mean it so much more this week and in such a different way than I've ever prayed it. God, I don't want to say anything useless this morning. I pray that everything I speak will come out of your heart and will be transmitted into the hearts of your people the way that you intended, because I feel the weight and the anointing and the pressure of this word. And I take seriously that you appointed me to deliver it. I'm humbled by it. I pray that it would go forth in power and that it would, oh, Father, that it would empower and touch your people. Father, it would bring the perspective it needs to bring. It would convict who needs to be convicted. It would encourage who needs to be encouraged. And it would move your kingdom forward at all costs. In your name we pray. Amen. This message is a living sacrifice. I've just read to you a passage that many people have, have heard. It's a very familiar one. We like this one. Renew your mind. Get closer to the Lord. But here, here's the point I want to stick on this morning. Here's what I want to run through with you. As Christians, as the church, as disciples of Christ, as people who claim to be children of the Most High God, we cannot peddle salvation to people without requiring that they experience also the price of a death and a resurrection. We cannot peddle or offer salvation to people freely as if it's just a great gift and a great doorway to come into a wonderful life without fully disclosing to them that there is a price for it that is a death and a resurrection. And it's a death and a resurrection that is not just confined to the death of Jesus Christ. It's his model of what must happen to me. We know with, I mean, you've heard, the, it's, a, it's a cliche thing. Ministers say this all the time. Oh, if something doesn't die, you can't raise it. We like saying that in the church, and that's a great idea. Well, if something doesn't die, you can't be a resurrection if you didn't bury it and kill it. But we live as if that doesn't have to happen. And the world has seen the, the inauthenticity, the lack of sincerity in the church and in Christians for so long that they no longer consider the church a viable option in many situations because they've seen that we have tried to live resurrected, though nothing in us has ever died. My son is not here this morning. I wanted to use him. If I brought my son up on stage and showed him to you and I said, this is my son, would you agree with me? Yes, that's your son. We know him. We've seen him. If I said, this is my resurrected son who was once dead but now lives, you would all look at me like I had three heads, like you just did. <laughs> why, why would that be so puzzling to you? Why would you not take my word for it? I told you it happened. I'm the preacher. I'm standing in the pulpit. I've got a microphone, and you have to listen to every word I say. I just read a Bible verse. Why don't you believe me? Well, there's no evidence that anything ever died. There's no death event. There's been no mourning. There's no tragic sickness that we heard about. There's not been an accident. There was no announcement of the funeral. No one called the family. My wife doesn't seem upset. The siblings don't even seem to know anything about it. There's no service. There's no burial. You don't believe me because there's no evidence that he's ever died. Truth is, he isn't resurrected because he hasn't died. Your faith and the way you display it to the world around you is no different. You're not fooling anyone by pretending to be a Christian just because you're a good person. 
the world knows that nothing has changed just because your behavior is different they can see that nothing in you is different because you haven't died with Christ and so nothing has been resurrected that can testify to the goodness of God people know when something is a fraud me saying oh behold my resurrected son is obviously a fraudulent claim it's not true the world sees the same about us. You've gone around preaching new life, and yet you still look the same. You don't even behave that differently. You run your church like a McDonald's franchise and not like the house of God. You live your life wearing nicer clothes or dressing prettier or saying, I've set these three or four hours aside for the Lord while I go to church. But all the other hours in between, you look just like the other people that you work with and that you hang out with and that you play with, and you're watching the same movies and listening to the same music and behaving in the same way that they do because nothing in you has died yet. You've just added Christianity to your life as if it's a supplement. It's not become the defining characteristic of you. There's a lot of confusion about faith and doctrine and salvation, even among people that call themselves Christians. And some of those people calling themselves Christians aren't saved and they don't even know it because their salvation didn't require anything more of them than a confession. It didn't require a death and a resurrection. I don't have to change. I just have to say the right words. I said the prayer. I read the verse out of the Bible. I showed up for church, so I'm saved. Externally, that might seem to be true, but the reality is something has to die. The church has done a terrible job of peddling salvation and saying, just accept the Lord and things will be great. But accepting the Lord means take up the cross and something dies and he brings it back to life. Your actions may cover this confession of faith and you definitely need to confess that you're saved. Scripture tells us to. But just that confession of faith fails to identify us with the death and resurrection of Christ. It doesn't cost us anything. And even unsaved people recognize this variety of Christianity that's just the words we say and not actually something in us being different. They recognize that that's incomplete and it's insincere. And it's why they don't want to follow him. Scripture tells us clearly that there's got to be two things. There's got to be confession and there's got to be belief, okay? Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, fa you will be saved. Confession alone is not just not enough. You can say anything you want, but the words don't make it true. If anything, the confession is saying this is the standard to which my belief will be held, but what I believe will be demonstrated by my actions. The act of speaking without belief is to speak without faith, and faith without works is dead. It's ineffective, and it will not bring you into the presence of God. It will not save you. James 2.22, we're speaking of Abraham here. The brother of Jesus says, when we talk of Abraham, you see that faith was active together with his works, and by faith, or and by works, his faith was perfected. You can have the confession that says, I believe. Your works and your physical expression of his lordship, that's evident, but you've also got to have a faith that, quite frankly, you are not capable of producing in yourself. It's got to come from the Holy Spirit. Something in me has to die and be replaced with something outside of me, or else my belief and my salvation aren't even possible. You can't believe in your heart unless you've been transformed. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We read that just a few moments ago. Let me give you an example. Let's say that there is a person who attends our church. A man who says he believes, but he still has sin in his life. And so, because I love him, because I am his pastor and I am his friend, I go to him in private and I say, look, I know you say you love the Lord, but there's this evidence in your life of sin, that you have a love of something else. We need to address this because I'm concerned about your position in relationship with the Savior right now. The man confronted with that can respond in one of two ways. The first answer would be this. You know what? You're right. I need to stop doing what's wrong, and I need to start doing the right thing. I have got to make a decision 
to do what the Bible says? Seems like a wonderful answer on the surface. But here's the problem with this response. It's all about me and my behavior and what I'm going to do. It's all about my works. There's nothing transformed about me just deciding to do something else. He might as well just say, you know what? I still love the world and I love everything in it and I love my sin and I love my drinking and I love my cheating on my wife and I love all the cursing that I do. I love all these things that I'm doing. In fact, you know what? They bring me closer to the world, Pastor. It gives me an opportunity to minister because I'm relatable. But I guess, I guess I'll just start denying myself some of those things, and that'll be my sacrifice unto the Lord so that I can be closer to Him. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. That idea that I would just still be in love with the world, but I will sacrifice and deny myself the thing I want in love because I'm doing God a favor, something's wrong with that perspective. Something is out of alignment with that. In fact, it's a complete contradiction to the first part that says don't be conformed to this age. It doesn't just mean change your behavior. It means don't be in love with the things that they love. If you're conformed to this age, if you're still loving and enjoying your sin and you feel like you're doing God some great service or it's some great sacrifice that you have to perform to not do the wicked thing you love, you've not been transformed yet. The renewing of your mind has not happened because transformation requires the part of me that loves the world to die. Transformation means something has changed and I don't love or desire that anymore. That's the first problem. It's all about me and my works and my decision and what I'm willing to give up, which leads us to the second problem with the man's response. I don't get to choose what I will sacrifice for the Lord. God chooses what gets sacrificed and what will please him. When we look at our salvation, God sacrificed his son because he determined that that was the only acceptable sacrifice. It's the only one that's sufficient. God set the standard for what sacrifice is when we talk about getting into a relationship with him. I don't get to pick that. In Luke 14, 28, Jesus is speaking and he speaks of counting the cost. I don't set the cost. God does. It's the same as if I went to the grocery store. I go to Amazon or I go to Walmart. I don't get to grab everything I want off the shelf and go up to the cashier and say, I'm willing to pay $8 for this. It's not how it works. Now, I understand in some cultures in the Middle East, that might be what you do. It's a $10 item, but they're going to start out asking you for $25, and if you're a dumb tourist, you're going to pay that, and they made a lot of money that day. They expect you to haggle. They want you to come up and say, well, I'll give you three, and you eventually work your way down to nine or ten. It's not how it works. Go to Amazon.com, fill up your cart, and show me where the button is where you can pick your price. Because that would, that would help me out a lot in my house. <laughs> if I could decide what the price was. But I don't get to set the price of my groceries, or my new guitar gadget, or my new car. Likewise, I don't get to tell God what I'm willing to sacrifice in exchange for the salvation he's going to provide me. I can't just decide what I'm going to sacrifice for him because if I do that, I'm the one that's in control and God doesn't share the seat of control with anybody. It's his way or the highway. And that's not him being hard. That's him setting boundaries because if there were no limits, there would be no need for the sacrifice in the first place. If I can do whatever I want and still make it to heaven, there's no need for Jesus to have sacrificed anything at all. There's a line. Jesus is the way. And the price of me participating in what Jesus provided is I accept what the Lord says must be sacrificed in me so that I can be in his presence. If you find yourself in a position where you need to justify the things that you are not sacrificing for him, then you're not transformed yet. Your mind hasn't been renewed, and you can't be resurrected because you're not dead. 
well, the reason I still play this game and I'm not offended by the thing that you think I should be is this. The reason that I still go hang out at this place, the reason I still have these friends, the reason I hang on to this behavior, the reason I still listen to this music, the reason that I still fill in the blank, the reason this is still acceptable in my life is because if I'm in right standing with God, I don't need to justify anything. But if I feel compelled to justify to you why I've not sacrificed it, perhaps it's because it's not yet dead. And I'm loving it more than I'm loving the Lord, and I'm trying to set my own price on my salvation. See, that's the problem, again, with this first answer. I need to just stop doing these things. Me deciding to stop is insufficient because it's about me deciding about me deciding what I'm going to do rather than me deciding that I will accept what has been provided for me. Salvation is about the Lord says, I have done this for you and this is the cost. It's not about me walking in and saying, I'd like to have this, here's what I'll pay. I need to stop doing these things is not the answer of a disciple, it's not the answer of a sheep, it's not the answer of a son or a daughter or a Christian. I've got to accept what God's offered on God's terms or walk away from it. These are the issues with the first answer, but the second answer could be this. Sir, you've got some issues in your life. I love you. I care about you. What are we going to do to address these things? You know what? You're right. My faith is weak. And I can't change these things on my own. I've tried. I need the Lord. I need the Lord to do the work because I can't. Because I've made the decision over and over and over. I've been at the altar 14 times in 14 weeks because I have to keep making the decision again and again. My decisions aren't sufficient to keep me from doing this thing. I'm not strong enough to kill it, to eradicate it, to wipe it out, to get it out of my life. I need the Lord to transform my mind. That's the response of a disciple. Because it's the acknowledgement of a man who understands that he is powerless against his own nature. That's a man who's got some humility and says, I'm not too proud to say I need help with this. That's sincerity. That's a man who's accepting God's terms, no matter what the cost, even his own pride or justification for why I still love what I love. I told you you have to have confession and belief. The transformation of our mind begins with belief, and we're not capable of believing without God's supernatural intervention. I won't change my behavior until I believe something different. And I need the Spirit to make me believe differently than I do. Matthew 16, 17, Jesus talks to Peter. I use this verse all the time. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but it came by my Father in heaven. I need something supernatural to help me make a decision to believe differently than I do, to behave differently than I do. I can confess all day long, but something in me has to die and be replaced with the power of the Spirit. Acts 11, 14 through 16, Paul is talking about the Gentiles and their belief. And he says, I will speak a message to you, or I'm sorry, he will speak a message to you that you and all your household will be saved by. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as at the beginning. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You can't come to belief without the intervention of the Holy Spirit. Peter, in the presence of Jesus, couldn't do it. The Gentiles that Paul was trying to minister to couldn't do it. They required the intervention of the Holy Spirit in their life. The Holy Spirit is what transforms us because if that is the active, living, loving nature of God that's present in the world today, I've got to replace my nature with it. And I'm not capable of doing that. You ever tried to do surgery on yourself? I've gotten better at it over the years. I've gotten a few splinters and a few split toenails, and I've gotten a couple of small, minor injuries that I've had to work out. But it's not the most pleasant thing to take a razor blade and slice your own skin open to pull something out that's not supposed to be in it takes a certain amount of courage and stealing yourself and just realizing, well, it's, it's this or nothing. I think about the guy that was rock climbing several years ago and got himself pinned underneath a boulder and had to cut his own arm off. That surgery could not have been simple, if you can even call it surgery. 
You don't hear many people that say, I need a liver transplant or a lung transplant, or I've got to have surgery to open up my sinuses because I can't breathe. You don't hear many folks that say, I'm just going to strap myself to the table in the basement, get out the drill and take care of this. I'll be back in an hour. Doesn't happen. Here, bite down on this leather strap and pour some moonshine on it and go to town. It'll be fine. I know some people do that in a pinch, but that's not the preferred method for fixing a problem. We don't operate on ourselves. If I need my spirit and my nature transplanted, I'd like the Lord to do it rather than me trying to take care of it myself because I don't want it to look like what it would look like if I tried to drill my own sinuses out or detach my own arm or even take a splinter out of my hand and have to deal with whatever that is in the palm of it for weeks at a time. As inconvenient as something that small is, a splinter in my hand, replacing my nature with his is something that I don't have any business trying to do myself. It's not my job. Stay in your lane. Christians, people of God, let the Lord do the work he's designed to do and stop trying to do it yourself. Don't perform your own surgery. You can't believe without the intervention of the Holy Spirit, the transformation that you need has got to come from outside of yourself. And the reason we need to understand this as an intervention, as something outside of me getting involved in a potentially hostile situation, you've seen these shows, right? I think I'm going to mom and dad's for dinner, but really everybody I know is there to tell me they're sending me off to get clean because I've been stoned for so long and I can't function. I may even be somewhat hostile to that. My nature may be somewhat hostile because I still love these things from the world, but I need an intervention. I need an outside source. I need to at some point say, I can't make the decisions to fix this myself. And the spirit has to come and intervene on my behalf, even when my nature might be a little rebellious about it. The intervention of the Holy Spirit is what's important because that's what places God in control. I let go and I let him drive. The kingdom of heaven is a monarchy. That's why they call it a kingdom. You understand what that means? There's a king. There's one guy in charge. There's not like three or four little kings. There's one guy at the top. It's a pyramid that works its way down. It's a monarchy, and the only way a new king gets appointed is when the old king is dead. You don't appoint a new king while the old king lives. There's a lot of reasons for that. The old king cannot like the way things are going, and the old king can decide to take the throne back. The old king could decide, if I can't overthrow these people, I'll go to that town next door because they liked the way I was king, and I'll go be king there, and then we'll attack this kingdom, and I'll have a kingdom twice the size. If he's a good king, you replace him when he dies. If he's a wicked king, you kill him so he doesn't come back to bite you. The Holy Spirit intervening puts God in control, and the old king's got to go. Truly becoming saved is an act of succession. That's what you call it when new leadership takes over. I die, God assumes control. That's what being saved looks like. And we have sold salvation as just a way to live a better life and find a new truth and be happier and be blessed. And that's not what it is. It's an act of something dying and being replaced with an improvement. Galatians 2, 20 and 21, you've heard this before. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. This is the means of salvation. We confess and we believe, and belief requires me to die, and I no longer live. That's what dead means. My mother has passed away. If someone were to tell me she was on the phone, that would be startling. If someone told me she were to knock at the door, that would be unsettling to a degree that I can't describe to you. I saw her. I saw her dead and lifeless. I saw the urn from where they had cremated her. She is gone. She's not coming back. Not in this life. cost of our salvation is not just that Jesus had to die. It's not that he died just to freely provide something for me. He gives it at no cost. I know that. Salvation doesn't cost anything. The word's free, brother, but it costs money to get it to people. I know that. I've heard it all my life. 
But the death of Jesus is about something more than what he provided for me. Because part of what he provided is a way. His death is a blueprint of what has to happen to my nature if I want to experience the life that he set forth for me. I've got to become as dead as he was to live as much as he lives. That sacrifice of Jesus and his death and resurrection, it tells us a whole lot more about ourselves and our situation than we want to hear. We like the resurrection part. My nature's got to go. Somebody else has got to sit on this throne. I can confess by, with my mouth all day long, but until the Spirit of God displaces my desire and my nature, I'm dead and there's nothing to raise. Or I'm not yet dead and there's nothing to raise. Until the Lord comes in and replaces, until I say, all right, do the work. There's no resurrection in me, and I've got no part of what Jesus provided until I follow the path and the example that he set. Without his power to raise me, I'm still floundering in my own work. And that's why the church and a lot of the leadership in it and a lot of Christians are in turmoil and chaos right now because they're lost in this political and cultural and spiritual landscape of what are we going to do? What's the church look like now? Everything's a mess. What does saved actually mean? Arguing about doctrine on the internet while the world falls apart around us. Nobody's actually trying to live saved. We're trying to get our doctrine right when at the end of the day, if we would just die to ourselves and die to our perspective and die to what we want and ask the Lord what he wants, he would unite everything. We're not going to unite ourselves arguing about what we don't agree over. We're not going to unite ourselves by having some big debate or some big universal conference where we bring all the different denominations together. What's going to bring us together is if we put all this stuff down and stop trying to find out what makes us different and say, Lord, make us the same. Change me. Kill what's in me that doesn't belong. Give me your perspective. Fill me with something other than what I'm full of because right now I just want to argue with my brother. We're lost because there are places where we've just not been willing to die. 1 Peter 4, 17 through 19 says this, The time has come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So those who suffer according to God's will should, while doing what is good, entrust themselves to a faithful creator. Did you hear that first line? Judgment begins in the house of God. That's the church. I don't mean the building. I mean you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the living God? 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19. I believe it's 19. Should have put it in my notes. Check me on that. Forgive me if I'm wrong. Judgment begins in the house of God. It begins in the temple that's you. Have you died and is God ruling in your life? And if judgment were to begin in your house, if judgment were to begin in your temple, in your heart, in the place where God is supposed to be residing, would we find that the Holy Spirit is present there or not? Do the desires that you had for the wickedness of the world still linger? And do you still entertain those things as welcome guests in your home? I've said this before, and I'm going to say it again this morning. We will sometimes invite things into our house through that glass panel of our television screen or through our computer screen or through this thing. We'll invite it right into our home, into our eyes, into our mind, into our heart. But if the same thing knocked on my front door, I'd have the gun out ready to get rid of it. I'm not inviting rape and murder and cursing and blasphemy into my house if it's standing on my front porch, but I'll turn it on and turn it off and call it entertainment. I'm not standing up just to give you a hard time about your entertainment. Let the Spirit do what the Spirit does. I'm simply saying we've got to be careful what am I inviting in. If I looked internally and said, what is taking up residence here? Is the Holy Spirit what I'm going to find, or am I going to find justification for the things that are sitting where God should be? Are you looking at the abstinence that you have from the things of the world as some great sacrifice that you're performing for God? Because if so, you still don't have Paul, you still don't have some part in the resurrection. There's something in you that's not died. And if nothing's been raised, then nothing has changed, and we're a people of empty works and we're working in vain. There's that phrase that everybody likes to say, especially in Pentecostal churches, well, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost by God, brother. It's wonderful. It's a great sentiment. I'm not making fun of it. If it's true, it's great. I'm not saying those things all happen at once either. Eventually, we should all be saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. 
I pray for you that it did happen to you all at once, and I pray for people that meet him that it happens all at once, because it's a great shortcut that you don't have to go through the process the rest of us do of progressively looking at my life and saying, this has to die, and that has to die, and i got to put this aside as the Lord progressively reveals things to me. I would love to have had an instant conversion experience and let the Lord take me home right away and not have to go through the process of continually learning what I'm not doing well. Growing is not great. Sat under a pastor one time, he used to say, I like to have changed but I don't like changing. I, I like being able to say, I've lost 20 pounds, but I don't like spending three months in the gym to do it. It'd be great if it was instant. I've made a decision to be healthy. <laughs> oh, look at me. 32 inch waist. I grew two inches taller. I have excellent muscle definition. I decided this morning and look, See how well this worked, right? <laughs> Salvation doesn't work that way either. It is progressive. God take you to heaven the minute that you got saved if you were perfect. And I know it takes time, but we can't use the process as an excuse to continue loving the world because your preference is not a valid excuse to delay the dying process. What I prefer, what I like, the things that it's taking me some time to decide I won't do anymore. And while the Lord's working on me, it takes a while. It's not instant. It doesn't happen overnight. No, it doesn't. But if the Lord's pointed it out to you, it's time to change it. If the Lord's convicted you about it, if he's brought it to your attention, if there's guilt, if there's a need to justify, it's something the Lord says the season to die is upon you for this. It's got to go. There are too many people that believe they're disciples and they're experiencing a distance and a separation from God that they can't explain, but it's because they're trying to live a resurrected life when nothing in them has changed yet. Nothing yet has died, or they're not willing to let go of the thing. I'll just do my best, Pastor. I got to do better. No. This morning, you need to ask the Lord, Father, give me your perspective so that I can change. Take the desires I have away from me. Because supernaturally is the only way it's going to happen. I can't. If you'll stand with me, I'm getting ready to close. If you're struggling with your faith, if you're struggling with some aspect of it, if you're struggling with some manner of addiction, if you're struggling with some variety of your lifestyle, and you're just not certain why I can't seem to get through this thing, my question to you is, have you died to that thing? Have you died with Christ? If you're stuck somewhere in your faith or in your life, What is it that you're refusing to sacrifice this morning? What is it that's supposed to be dead that's not? That's the question the Lord has for us this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity to come before you. And I thank you for this perspective on your word. And I thank you for this chance to look at things from your perspective. I thank you, Father, that, oh, I thank you, Lord, that you don't make it easy. Because, Lord, I like to know that something happened. And I don't like the struggle, but I certainly like the victory. As difficult as this is to hear this morning, Lord, but I stand here and repent. I say, Lord, I am sorry for the things that I have not let die. I am sorry if I have made salvation seem too easy. I am sorry if we have made it too simple for people. And I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would do his work in the lives of those that are listening. And you would reveal to us today what needs to change. What's got to be different in me? Father, what have I refused to sacrifice? Now that we've seen something needs to die, now that we've seen that the example of your son is what has to happen in me, Father, in what place does your spirit need to take up residence where he's not? I pray that your spirit would work right now in the hearts and minds of everyone that's listening and you would reveal that place to them and they would be willing to, reveal, willing to surrender it to you. And God, I pray that your spirit would be faithful to come and take its place. I pray right now for the power of your spirit to work in the minds and the hearts of those that are listening, that are here truly because they want to be part of your kingdom. And I pray that you would do that work. God, in the same way that you have with me, in the same way that you have with those in so many times in the Bible, those who met you, Father, like you did with the Gentiles that Peter spoke of, Father, like you did with, excuse me, with, with Peter as he was in your presence and with the Gentiles that Paul spoke of, Lord, I pray this morning that you would change us and give us your perspective and you would take from me my natural desires and replace them with yours. Father, that you would remove the things from my life that don't belong. And I pray that you would do it for everyone who's willing to pray that prayer. 
take control. Make me a living sacrifice. Give me the strength and the power, Father, that comes only from your Holy Spirit to lay down what's precious to me and instead pursue what is precious to you. We love you. We thank you again for your your presence here with us this morning and the chance to be in your house. Be with us as we go. Keep us safe until we we return again. You're so good to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. God bless you. I hope you'll be able to be back here tonight at 6. If not, catch us online. I have another message that I'm looking forward to sharing with you about identity, who you are in Christ. That's what we'll be talking about tonight at 6. God bless you. Have a good day. You're dismissed.